Hello everyone, welcome to problem 3.21 in David Griffith's Electrodynamics. All right, so we've got a good one today. Um, <clears throat> this one says to find the potential outside a charged metal sphere, um, with, who has, which has a charge Q, capital Q, and a radius of capital R, and it's placed in the otherwise uniform electric field E0. Explain clearly where you are setting the zero of potential. All right, so <clears throat> this problem is essentially the same as example 3.8 in the book that David Griffiths does. And the only difference is in example 3.8, the, the sphere that we placed in the field had no charge on it, it was uncharged, whereas this sphere is charged. So really the question is, okay, so how does adding charge to the sphere affect the potential and Griffiths has an answer for this problem that's a little um, kind of vague. It doesn't really, I mean, you can, you can kind of see where it comes from in the end, but it's like he kind of just throws that out of nowhere, and I couldn't really follow it. And there's a video um, actually by someone on YouTube named, I believe, Ryan Smith. I'll link his channel below um, because he did a great kind of logical walkthrough of how to actually derive this answer. And I kind of went through it myself and kind of redirected here for you guys. <clears throat> so essentially what we have is, you know, we have our sphere that has a charge Q and a radius capital R. We have a constant uniform field um, that's pointing in the Z direction. X is coming out of the board, Y is going in the plane of the board. Um, and yeah, that's really it. So, you know, we know that the field is going to kind of be um, kind of morphed around the sphere. And as you get further away from the sphere, it's going to become more constant, right? But very close to the sphere, the charge on the sphere is also going to kind of morph the field a bit now. And because of the field, charges, you know, positive charges are kind of moving towards the top hemisphere. Negative charges move towards the bottom hemisphere. And so that creates a, an induced electric field in this in the and the ball, and that creates its own small electric field. So there's a bunch of electric fields here um, creating potentials. <clears throat> so we want to find what the potential as a function of r and theta is outside the sphere. And we know that the sphere is a conductor, so it is an equipotential surface. So we know that you know it's a conductor, so the surface of the sphere, everywhere inside the sphere is an equipotential. And for the purposes of this problem, you know, it says the state where you can set the potential to be zero at. For the purposes of this problem, I set the potential to be zero on the xy plane, um, you know, just for convenience purposes for how we measure the potential. So, and our origin is at the center of the sphere. Um, and just to kind of reiterate, if you look at problem 3.8, the potential that he derives uh, with a for a sphere without charge is you know minus e naught cosine theta which so this is the potential that kind of comes from um, I think there's an R here uh, this is the potential that comes from the external field so this is just e naught <laughs> and then um, and this is the potential that comes from the induced field so um, and and R cosine theta is also just z so this can also be stated as minus e naught z so, um, anyways, this is what is, this is the potential without charge. And so you can kind of just guess that, you know, there's going to be some other term here that we're going to add on, you know, for the fact that now we have charge on the sphere, right? So let's kind of derive this from first principles, right? So we kind of set up some boundary conditions and then use Laplace's equation to kind of figure this out. So. Our two boundary conditions can be at the surface of the sphere, r equal to r. We know if our, if our potential is zero you know, on the plane here, then potential at the radius of the sphere, you know, we can just say is the integral of, you know, from infinity to, um, or I guess in this case, instead of infinity, it would just be from, uh, um, if we're measuring the potential to be zero, uh, at the plane, then we measure from zero to R um, and get, 
this integral. This is just, you know, the standard um, equation for the potential that we derive in electrostatics. And, you know, do this integral, you get Q, kq over r, where k is just the Coulomb constant. And so this can be our first boundary condition. Um, and really, this should be capital R, sorry, since we're setting R equal to, to radius. Then the other boundary condition is that at infinity, then it should be that the potential is, you know, we, we start to lose the potential due to the, uh, um, let's see. So we have the minus E naught Z, so that's basically this term. So this is the potential from the external field because that's, you know, that's the strongest. It's, it's, you know, when we're far away from the sphere, we should still see the potential from the external field. And then the far field potential, this is the far field potential from the charge on the sphere. So KQ over R is a potential just due to the charge on the sphere. Um, you know, this should still be, you should still see the, you know, the charge, uh, the potential from the charge on the sphere. The induced field will kind of be negligible compared to those two. Um, so that's kind of our second boundary condition. And so I've kind of reiterated them up here um, and I rewrote them in terms of Legendre polynomials. So KQ over R can just be KQ over R times the zeroth polynomial, which is just one. And then minus E naught R cosine theta. So Z is just R cosine theta, <clears throat> just, you know, um, in spherical coordinates. Um, plus kq over r, so that can be written as minus e naught r p1, because cosine theta is just the first low boundary polynomial, plus kq over r times the zeroth. So you'll see why we did this in a second. So we know that the potential, you know, the solution from Laplace's equation is this. We have the summation over a sub l, r sub l plus b sub l over r to the l plus one times the l Legendre polynomial. We apply our first boundary condition so at the radius, we have, you know, this, uh, you just plug in capital R for here, and this must be equal to KQ over R P zero. So we can see here clearly that for the, um, for this boundary condition, the only term surviving is going to be the zeroth term. And so just put, let's plug in the zeroth uh, term here. We get a zero r zero plus b zero over r times p zero. You know p zero cancels out. We get some relationships here, so we see that b zero is equivalent to kq minus a naught r. That's just a simple some algebra here. And then we can solve also for um, all the l's. Um, you know, <clears throat> for all the other l's, this plus this must be zero because there is no other L's. So we can see that A sub L, R to the L equals minus B sub L over R to the L plus one. And this is basically the relationship that Griffiths has derived um, before. So this is just kind of rederiving that. And so for all other L terms um, above zero, this relationship should, should hold. And then just from direct comparison here, we can clearly see that um, A sub zero must be zero. Uh, R to the zero is just one. And then B sub zero must clearly be KQ because if, you, if B sub zero is KQ, then we get exactly what our potential is. So this is just from direct comparison of coefficients that A sub zero is zero and B sub zero is KQ, right? So those are some relationships that you can derive from the first boundary condition. Now, if we use the second boundary condition, um, <clears throat> just, just stating this again, that this, you know, at infinity, I don't know, pick some point, don't actually plug in infinity, but pick some point R that's really far away from the sphere. We get, you know, our standard uh, potential equation here must be equal to minus E naught R P one plus KQ over R P zero, just like I have from over here. And again, just, uh, you know, writing out here, I wrote down, we already know the zero term and the, um, the zero term. So I did for the L equals one, what, what's the summation going to be? We have, you know, A1R plus B1 over R squared times P1 must be equal to this. And then just from direct comparison here, well, um, the P1 will cancel, like here, 
comparing these two coefficients, A1 must be equal to negative E0, because uh, we already have the R there. So A1 is negative E0, and we know here that B sub L is related to A sub L um, by that equation, so we can derive B1 to just be E0 capital R cubed, because A sub L is negative E0, so negative 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 is positive E0, and then R to the 2L plus 1, plug in 1, you get 3. So we can derive the, the second uh, terms here, but that's really all, all we have. Um, so all the other L terms must be zero because <clears throat> that's the highest polynomial we have in our, for our boundary condition. So we can say that all the you know, A2, A3, B2, B3, whatever is all zero. And so <clears throat> just taking our results for this and plugging them into our, you know, our function here for the, uh, the potential. So we just plug in, you know, this, do this, you know, do the summation all the way up to whatever L polynomial. And for our case, it's just zero and one. So, you know, we have a zero R to the zero plus B zero over R to the zero plus one times P zero. That's the first term I saw plus a1 r to the 1 plus b1 over r squared times p1. So that's the second term in our sum. And then we know all these coefficients, so just plug them in. So this is 0. b0 is kq over r times p0 plus a1 is minus e0 times r times p1, just distributing that, plus b1 is e0 r cubed over r squared times p1. And then just plugging in, kind of rewriting this again, we have kq over r, this is just one, so I took it out. We have minus e naught r cosine theta, so because p1 is cosine theta, and then plus e naught r cubed over r squared cosine theta. So this is what well, our potential is outside the sphere. And, and it fits our boundary conditions, and you know, it actually fits what the, you know, we compare what the solution was without charge, we see that we have two of the same terms here, the external field and the induced field, right? We have both of those terms, the external field and the induced field. So that didn't change, but we added this extra term here, which is the potential due to the charge on the sphere. So just like we said, we knew that there should be some other term here, and you know, we found it. So you know, Griffiths solves this problem by just kind of stating it outright. <clears throat> and uh, I just didn't make any sense. So I kind of did some research and kind of thought about this myself. So, and, and again, I'll link the video um, to the, the guy that I watched that also kind of went through the same reasoning process. So he kind of helped me out here. So if you guys do have any questions, please feel free to let me know. And uh, yeah, that'll be it. Thank you.